So first, I know we should hang out, have lunch. All right. So first off, thank you for being on my show, the Metal Mixtape, dude. Uh, I appreciate you being on. I appreciate you making time. Um, I remember listening to you guys when I was like 13 or 14 years old. I'm 31 now. So, um, so, so this is, this is uh, hey, this this is a pleasure, man. I know I I got knee problems now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know it's really I I joke about it, but the the reality is, I mean, that's pretty cool for us. It's really cool. And it's really cool how people have kind of grabbed onto it again. Every bit as exciting as, you know, when we first came out in the 90s. So, um, you know, I'm I'm 54 now. So, it's it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you know what, bro? Uh, it's weird. It's kind of weird for me, too, man, because, you know, um, I, I get to talk to people I admire, so... You know, if you would if you would have told me when I was fourteen that I was going to talk to Ken J from Static X, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, one thing I would will tell you, and I'll, I'll I'll probably if you mention that more than once, I'll probably chuckle at it. I, <laughs> I guess it's kind of weird because we're not. If you would have told us twenty two years ago, or even twenty years ago when we first started touring um, that 20 years later Death Trip would still be, you know have the impact that, that it did and look man there's been a couple of people that have referred to me as a legend in the interviews and and that that comes it's funny to me a little bit I guess I'm, I'm not removed from <laughs> you know I'm a I'm a normal guy that just was in this weird band and you know I it's so thank you I mean it's it's an honor it's our honor that you guys you know still enjoy it still grab onto it man oh ab- absolutely man you know um like it's just like you know like um I've been in this industry just playing in bands and and doing like radio for years that like you know it takes a real struggle and you know uh, for a long time you know we do this all for free and we do it because we love it you know and and if we and if we don't love it, you know, like there's no longevity ever. So, you know, the way I see it, being a grown up now, since when I became a musician as a kid, is that like it's more like you know I I admire that you pushed as far as you did and you put as much work ethic and dedication as you did. So for me, like you know, if you call somebody a legend, for me it's like you know like you know like you're admiring somebody who worked hard, you know. Well, and that, that, um, and that's the thing, you know, I mean, granted, you know, the, the industry has changed so much, um, from what it was, I would say now bands really, uh, and the thing is, is, you know, the internet and social media was, I think that everybody thought that that was going to make it easier and it is the easier to network, but I would also tell you that the industry's changed so much that you're always scrambling. I, I would tell you in that sense, your your the, the younger generation, you know, does work a lot harder overall. Whereas, I mean, we had it was a much more streamlined, simple way for us, which was. Write good songs, get get a mailing list built up, get label interest. You know that that was the three step process. Um, now I know that that's oversimplifying it, but and we did. You know, we hung out at a lot of shows and flyered, and oh my gosh, I've I've slept more gear than any human being should be allowed to. <laughs> but, um, you know, now it, it really, there's a lot of hard work involved in it, even for local cover bands. You know, they, they find out. I have a couple of buddies that I played with in bands when we were younger, yeah. and they got away from the industry and had kids, and, you know, families and kids, and had these great careers, and now that they're kind of semi-retired, they're going back and, 
in starting just local cover bands for fun because they they like the weekend warrior aspect. Yeah. And and I warned I warned both of them before they started. And this has been within the last ten years. I said, look, you know, it's it's work, man. Being in a band is work, and not just the practice aspect. Like you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be social media work, flyering, and doing all this stuff. And they they totally got it, you know. Um, but th- thank you, I I appreciate it, and um, just know that since you're a musician, I admire you too. I think it's you know, hey, hey. it's an interesting way to live, isn't it? You know what? Honestly, um. I can't think of any other way to live, you know. I feel like ever since I was born, I was meant to, like, talk to people and, you know, just communicate through music, you know. And a, a lot of people I've met or interviewed, you know, like uh, Michelangelo Badio, you know. He told me ever since he was, like, a little kid that he always knew that he was just stuck on music and that he had to do it and not quit no matter what, you know. So it was kind of like, you know, like, I, I can't really see myself doing anything else, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you don't want to get me started, but <laughs> I'm, I, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing an interview here, mister. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Yeah, no, but yeah, no, I, I love it. But, um, you know what I, I want to know, Ken J? I'm going to start you off with my first question. You ready? Yep. All right. So, um, wh- uh, so I know um, later in the interview we're going to get to uh, Project Regeneration, but I want to know a little bit about you. So, what I want to know is that um, how did you pick up uh, your first uh, uh, drum set, and um, how did you start uh, playing drums? Did you have family influence? Did you have? Um, did you just randomly like start banging pots and pans? How did that all start? Well, uh, for me, um, my mother was a drummer when she was younger. Wow, and um, she's also she's our church pianist. Uh, my father had played drums for a little bit when he was in junior high and high school. Wow. Uh, both of my sisters, uh, my oldest sister was a, a flautist. Uh, my middle sister played French horn. We all started, uh, you know, we all played piano a little bit. Um, my entire family was very musical. Um, and, and both sides, both mom and dad's side. Um, for me, my uncles on my mom's side had a rock band when they were in their late teens, early 20s, I think. And one of my uncles, when I was two years old, gave me an old wooden snare drum and a pair of fiberglass trainer sticks, which... They were weighted. I wouldn't re- really recommend it. I mean, they still make them. I think they make them out of aluminum now too. Oh. It's not like the it's not like East and the Head, yeah, which are durable drumsticks. These are weighted to kind of train your wrists and forearms. I don't know that I would necessarily recommend them, just simply because the uh, you can give yourself carpal tunnel with it. But mm-hmm. I was two, so you know, and this was the late sixties. Um, so that was my first drum. Um, my sisters were always, you know, we were small town Midwest, but my sisters were, are even to this day ridiculously hip and they love music. So I was exposed <laughs> to different kinds of music. Um, I got my first drum set when I was 11 or 12 for Christmas. And you know, school band. I'd been in school band for about a year at that point. Yeah. That was the that was the beginning of it. And you know, Kiss was out at the time. And oh yeah, Kiss Al- Yeah. So I had Kiss Alive and Kiss Alive Two, and that was really where I thought it was a cool thing, and I wanted to do that. And you know, it was kind of a little drummer boy. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, Peter Chris. Yeah. I was I, well, and I was. I was athletic, but I was also an artsy kid, you know, and so the, you know, the nonconformity of rock rock and roll appealed to me, I guess, because I I just was kind of an arty, different kid, you know, and I I wasn't like, I wasn't a social outcast or anything by any means, you know, it was small high school, so 
I mean, we're all practically family. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And I, I played my first show, my first band, I was 15 years old. We knew five cover songs, and we played in, an arcade <laughs> in a town. It, seriously. And I think only, it was owned by a family. Uh, two parents and a son that was about our age. He was like 16, 17. And they hired us for a gig on a Saturday night. We only knew five songs. So we played those five songs for like three hours. And, you know, only a couple of local kids showed up, you know. So we got the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and free soda. That was it. That was that was my first gig, you know. But um, That's awesome. So, yeah, that was... That was the beginning. Very extremely humble beginnings. <laughs> so, um, wh what, um, how did you get into like heavier music? You know, to like uh, being a band like Static X, like, because I know you're saying you're playing covers and you have all the inspiration from your family, but did you just like see an ad that they needed a drummer, or, or how did that all come about, or did it, was it a fresh band? Well, you know, the that what became Static X was kind of antithetical I'll get to that I'll explain it the weird so you know growing up in the 70s and you know being a huge kiss fan my dad was a truck driver and he owned his own truck and it was the first vehicle he had a, a dual eight track flash cassette deck in his semi and you know, he and mom both worked. He had two semis, so there was always one parked at the house. And I have um, a couple of cousins, one's a year older, one's a year younger, you know, all three boys. And so mom and dad would leave, and we'd have access to the semi. And so we'd just get in the truck and play around, and I found this cassette. And I, I was a KISS fan at the time, but they were starting in the... You know, Dynasty had come out, and then you were getting into Unmasked and The Elder. And disco was big, but I liked guitar-driven music, you know? And yeah. Kiss was going away from that a little bit. So I get in my dad's truck. I find this cassette that he bought it in a truck stop. It was probably only, you know, $2. And it had four bands on it. Okay. And it was Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, I think like MC5 or something. It was four hard rock bands. But the first time I heard I'm an 18, at which uh, <laughs> admittedly was an, an older song by that time, but I heard I'm an 18 and School's Out from Alice Cooper. Oh, yeah. And then... And then Black Sabbath and, and War Pigs. Um, I, those songs were like, and I, you know, I was out in the country. I didn't, you know, our nearest neighbor was a mile away. So they, those songs just freaked me out. They scared me to death. <laughs> but the guitars were so cool, and these drummers just sounded like they played with hammers. And so that was it. That was the beginning. And then... Um, Women and Children First for Van Halen came out and you know Tora 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 is such a ridiculously heavy song and uh, Romeo Delight that was you know it kept getting progressively heavier then you know end of Metallica and Anthrax and then uh, so when I moved to Chicago which was the late 80s um I met Wayne, and I tried out for them. I was, I wanted to do something different musically. I've been playing all the, in all these hard rock and metal cover bands and with really good players, but we weren't playing original music. And I was, you know, um, I was listening to different things, listening to a lot of the police, and but this goth music appealed to me, and I loved the cult. And the Deep Blue Dream demo I got, which was Wayne's band, kind of reminded me of, of the cult um, She Sells Sanctuary era. 
so I tried out for them. I absolutely loved it. And being the metalhead kid, you know, Wayne affected me with the goth thing, and I affected him with the metal thing. And we just kind of picked and chose, you know, through each other's favorite stuff. But we had to move out to L.A. to kind of rediscover our Chicago roots of, you know, industrial and dance music and techno and house and ambient and all that stuff. And um, we also still like guitar-driven music, and that was what Static X came out of. No, that's a big, long answer. Hopefully that tells you. <laughs> no, I no, I love it, man. I, uh, I feel like I'm going down History Road. I love this. So, dude, you know, L.A. is a pretty competitive market in everything. And, uh, you know, there's so many great bands and a lot of bands move there. Was there, like, a big pivotal show that, like, kind of, like, launched your guys' career that you guys played and was and you were just like, holy moly, like, there's so many people out in the crowd? Did you ever have a moment like that where you, where you were you were away and were just, like, talking to each other, like, man, like, this is the big show? Did you ever have a moment like that? Well, the, the first show... We, we were actually a three-piece, and we had shaved our heads. Tony hadn't yet, but we were a three-piece at the time. And we played at a place in Topanga Canyon called The Rock. And The Rock was, all of us from that L.A. scene eventually played there at some point. Um, this was our first time playing there, and we were opening. You know, I think we, it was us, Spine Shank, and... I can't even remember the third band, Flambuki, maybe, <laughs> which was uh, a band at the time. They were managed, I think Bob Kulik was their manager. and They were signed to an independent deal, but um, we played out there. We were opening. There were three people in the crowd. My sisters didn't even make it to that show. Oh, no. Yeah, they usually, you know, they were those, my sisters and Wayne's girlfriend were the only people seeing this. But there were three people in the crowd, and one of them was a girl that worked for Andy Gould Management. And she came up to us after the show, and she said, hey, do you guys, can I get a demo tape from you? And we had, you know, done what became the Static X demo. And she took our tape to the management company, and they called immediately. They were like, hey, we manage, you know, uh, Pantera and Typo Native and uh, Rob Zombie and uh, or White Zombie at the time and we were like whoa you know cool so that was step one and then what happened was I can't remember how he got our name but there's a guy that was he was the house sound guy at the Roxy and his name was Eddie Ortel oh, yeah. and Eddie you know yeah, Eddie's been out with everybody uh, as a sound guy now, but Eddie also booked, it was Eddie's birthday, so he booked a free Tuesday night show at the Roxy, and it was 10 bands, and eight of the 10 bands were signed within like a year and a half of that. Wow. Um, and that was, that was step two. Eddie, we were the opening band. Wow. And it, it was us and uh, Spine Shank and System and Snot and Spank, which became Ultra Spank. I mean, it, it was a big show. I can't remember who else played that. But, um, and it was free. And we, we went on as the doors opened. And it ended up being the biggest crowd we played to. And, you know, the response was great and everything. And then <laughs> Eddie came up. Eddie's so awesome at the time, and he's such a he's such a sweetheart, you know. But this was our first experience with him, and he came up and he's like, "All right, you know." There were seven minute changeovers between the bands, and he threw our stuff off stage as as we got done, and he's like, "All right, get off my stage." By the way, you guys were awesome. <laughs> now get out. Um, but yeah, we knew, you know. The response was good. The other bands responded to it, and awesome. we made friends that night, and it really took off after that. Dude, that is awesome. I, I love that so much, man. Um, so, uh, t you know, of course, you know, we all know um, the passing of Wayne, 
and um, you know how hard that must have been. Um, how was it transitioning? You know, um, starting the band again, well, with the new singer, and um, what were some of the challenges? Well, the the challenges were, you know, we rock music history is unfortunately filled with instances like this bands trying to figure out a way to move on and moving on after the death of a member, uh, and including lead singers. You know, this has happened before. Unfortunately, it's going to happen again. I hate to put it that way, but, you know, let's, let's be realistic about it. Yeah. The challenge, the challenge was, uh, really, we needed to find somebody, we wanted somebody experienced, somebody that could, you know, somebody that was themselves, but that could duplicate what Wayne did, but, I mean, there, there were just so many challenges, and while there is always a plan put in place, it's the music industry, so while you plan, a majority of your time is spent adapting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the writing for the album, once, once the demos were discovered, with Wayne's vocal, you know, we were writing backwards with that where we had established vocal and some programming. And so effectively you're building this house backwards, you know, you're not doing yeah. it foundationally. Um, it's, it's all been a challenge, but that being said, um, it was also the whole reason we did it was we felt that it was a way, I, I don't know, and I won't speak for the other guys, I, I'll speak for myself, but, you know, processing Dave, Wayne's death was a hard thing. And I, I think that we, uh, I will say this, what, I think that while he was alive, we all had the, the hope that there would be a reunion of the original lineup. But, you know, once he died, that kind of was dashed. And Tony was the one that st that started it and spearheads this thing and you know he found zero and they talked about it and we've just moved on ahead and and that became sort of the way to process not just Wayne's death but everything and all the challenges is you know adapt and, and use it as healing and moving forward Mm -hmm. um, and I think we wanted to be open with people and just say, hey, look, you know, it's nostalgic and we're going to look back at the past and and memorialize Wayne, but we're also going to look ahead and come along on this journey with us. We may not understand it all the time, um, but there, you know, Wisconsin Death Trip in itself, that was a good thing to come back with just because it's such a fun, bouncy, danceable record, you know, even though it's got an edge and everything. Um, it just, while there were challenges, things just fell into place, you know? Yeah. So, I don't know that I can offer a totally good answer for it, but that's an answer. No, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I understand, you know, and, uh, um, yeah, no, I I appreciate that answer. And and as a fan, you know, it's nice to um, hear your perspective. And I really enjoyed you telling me about like you know how the band started and everything. And uh, you know, it uh it, it inspires me to work hard and always uh, keep my head up. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, Project Regeneration Part One. So if, since it's Part One, is there going to be a bunch of parts? <laughs> I've I've been teasing people and telling. I mean. You know, it's kind of out there that there's enough source material and, and some extra recording already for volume two. Yeah. Um, that being said, I just like to tease people and say, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll do <laughs> a different record and come back to Project. But I, 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 the only thing I would tell you right now is 
you know, I'm in Illinois, the guys are in California, and there needs to be more work done on Project Regeneration Volume 2, but we also, because of the coronavirus right now and, and everything, you know, the industry effectively being shut down, we're kind of scrambling and thinking of new ways. You know, we were going to do somewhat limited touring this year anyway, really only a handful of shows in the States and mostly uh, European festivals in Russia and Ukraine. Um, you know, that's effectively kind of gone by the wayside, although it seems like uh, Ukraine and Russia are both uh, dealing with this well. Um, it, it remains to be seen because that's already been moved later on this year. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you know. I mean, some of it was going to be adding songs from Project Regeneration Volume 1 to the set, um, rethinking set design and, and the set itself, and, you know, by necessity, some of those death trip songs would have to be taken out of the set for now while we did different things and yeah. maybe some different other back catalog things. Well, that's kind of up all in the air, and so we're just going to, you know, push Project Regeneration Volume 1 out there um, because that's where we're at at the moment, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I dig it, yeah. man, you know, and I, and I appreciate, you know, you guys putting that out and... I know um, the Static X fans, Static X fans uh, truly appreciate it. So, uh, Mr. Ken J, um, we're going to get to the second part of the interview where I'm going to ask you five questions and you have a minute or less to answer each one. It's the fun part of the interview. Are you ready? <laughs> Got it. All right. In a zombie apocalypse, you only get one weapon to kill zombies. What's that weapon? Nuclear. Nuclear? <laughs> okay. If you could be a superhero or super villain for a day, or one that best represents your personality, who would it be? Batman, Dark Knight era. <laughs> All right. If you could play drums for one set with any band in any era, what band would it be? Kiss in 1976. <laughs> I love it, man. Is there one food that you think is absolutely disgusting? <laughs> uh, lima beans. <laughs> lima beans, okay. Um, uh, besides, like, the rock, the hard rock music, um, what's uh, one band that uh, Static, X Static X listeners wouldn't expect that you listen to? Um, for me personally, I listen to a lot of Jeff. I would say Miles Davis. Hey, I love Miles Davis too, man. Well, hey, uh, Mr. Ken J, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking to me today. It's a pleasure. Anytime I get an opportunity to talk to uh, inspirational individuals like yourself, um, I walk with an extra little skip in my uh, walk. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, you know, just so you know, I... I I take that as an honor, um, and it also kind of, that drives me to not let you guys down, you know, in any way, so, so you, you, you guys are as inspirational to me <laughs> as uh, it seems I may be to you, I guess. <laughs> well, hey, brother, um, will you do me one last favor before I let you go? Sure, absolutely. Um, would you give me a station ID? Would you go, uh, this is Ken J from Static X, and you're listening to The Metal Mixtape? Metal mixtape. Yes, sir. That's it? Yep. Okay. Hey, this is Ken J from Static X, and you are listening to the Metal Mixtape. Hey, I'm going to keep following you, brother. You have a, a safe, beautiful day, all right? Oh, you too, man. Stay safe. Take care out there, and hopefully we'll get to see you face-to-face -face soon, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, and if I see you face-to-face, -face, I'm going to walk up to you and be like, hey, man, remember I was the guy, the zombie guy, the zombie question guy. <laughs> No, I would say lima beans. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. You have a good day. Have a good day. All right. Take care, man.